Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Andrew Turner, host and founder of the GNC Sessions podcast. And today we've got an amazing guest, Mr. Graham Brown. Hi, Graham, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you, Andrew, for your very warm welcome. It's great to be here. Good to see you too. You've got, you, you got yeah. your headgear on. You look like a DJ, you see, that, or a pilot, well, like a pilot. This is what I do for a living podcasting. You've got, you got, you got, like you got like a hat on as well, I think. Is that right? Wow, well, that's only, yeah. That's only because. I haven't actually done my hair for this. I didn't realise we were going to be doing video. Ah, I'd known I would have had makeup. We oh, you're going to be a YouTube star you see, after this episode. No, so, I think I'm a little bit on the wrong side of 45 to be a YouTube. Oh star. come on, come on, never say never. You mean TikTok star? <laughs> I got the face for radio. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what people said to me as well. Um, <laughs> so welcome to the episode. It's good to Thank have you. you here. I know yeah. you're a good voice. I know it's taken a while to get you on the show, but I'm glad you're here now. Obviously, I'm lavishing on the beach in London, <laughs> not down London. I don't actually, believe it. Actually, I'm now on Oxford Street. Yeah, they've removed all the stores because all the stores are shut. You see, so they just put, installed the beach on Oxford Street. So where about where about to see you today? Then where are you about to join? Singapore. Yeah. Singapore. Yeah, out in Singapore, West Coast, Singapore, West Coast. Yeah, it's good. I'm in the heart of it, so it's good to be here. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It's a good place. But you, but you don't sound like you've got a Singaporean accent. So it sounds like you've got... Uh, no, I mean, you know, I'm originally from England. I grew up in England. Um, but as soon as I could, I left um, to go and explore the world. You know, I graduated in the mid-90s. Back then, it was all about Japan. So as soon as I graduated, I got out and went to live in Japan because that, for me, was like where it was all happening. I mean, like if I was doing it now... I would have gone to China, but for me, it was all about Japan. It was back then. It was like TDK and Toshiba and TDK. Sort of, yeah, TDK <laughs> tapes. They did like 120, 120. Oh, so, oh, 120s. Oh, sorry, yeah, 120s. <laughs> yeah, that was what it was about back then. It was a different era, but that was you know. I think if you were kind of slightly curious about the world, interested in technology, that was where you went. There wasn't many other options back then. So it's, so it's quite interesting. So the the, um, the icky guy is it icky guy? Yeah. You know that? Well, I, I know of icky guy. Yeah. The kind of the, the, the way the way that the way they they live in Japan, the happy life in Japan. Yeah, I mean that that's the book, but the reality is is that that's more of a fantasization of Japanese life. I don't know any Japanese. My wife's Japanese. I've lived in Japan for many years. I don't know any Japanese who live like that. So, I mean, we have a sort of fantasy of what Japan's like, and it's very sort of zen mm. and calm, which, mm. like, for example, if you go to Tokyo, yes, it is calm and very orderly. However, you go into a Japanese person's house, and it's like, you know, it's so chaotic. It's full of stuff everywhere. It's so unzen. What you mean, lots of clutter? Yeah, it's crazy clutter. Any, any like <laughs> Japanese pe people will admit it themselves. They have stuff everywhere. Uh, it's not sort of like you would expect that kind of IKEA zen where it's very simple. Mm. Yeah. So we you have this sort of fantasy. One of room that's like a mess. You know, like you know, but they have all the rooms are a mess. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> So, so, so no, I've, I've been to Tokyo actually. So, I mean, I've been to um, Tokyo. I went to, I've been in Tokyo in, 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 on business, and there's quite a few guys there. And I've, just, I've done business actually in Tokyo. So, mm. it's, uh, it's a pretty, it's, it's a fascinating place. I think absolutely fascinating. Amazing place. It's a great place to live. I think it's hard. I mean, for me, for my background, in later years, I was involved in startups. It's hard being in startups in Japan. It's not a great place to be an entrepreneur. It's a great place to live but not a great place to be an entrepreneur, ironically. You know, why, because, why, why you say that? Well, it, it's very, well, on, like a lot of Asian cultures, with the exception of maybe China and some emerging economies are averse to risk. Right, okay, you know? yeah, okay. Yeah. There's a lot of that going on. But the thing is, is for example, like in Japan, there's, there's many alternatives, right? So why start a startup when you can work for Mitsubishi for 20 years? Mm. Mm. that you know that that's the ingrained mindset right right and thrown into that it's a very 
aging population so it's very conservative by nature i mean it's not conservative socially it's conservative with the attitude towards work for example right. it's changing but like for if you're an entrepreneur you you're about breaking the job for life it's like a job for life kind of approach well that's changing but yeah. that i mean that sort of salary man mm. culture is going away mm. But it's still, you know, it's many, many years behind a lot of countries in that respect. I mean, if, if you're an entrepreneur, you might as well be a yoga teacher. That's the point. It's sort of like seen in those terms, like it's an alternative lifestyle rather right. than a career choice, right? But don't, don't you, I mean, so, so you, you, but you, um, I mean, if you've been in Japan and obviously then you've, you're in Singapore now, so it sounds like you've been in Asia quite a lot. So you, I presume you, you've started to work out in different cultures. I've quite, done like quite a lot of work with in, in Korea, South Korea. Yeah. Have you been, have you yeah. been there as well? Do you, do you understand? What? Yeah, I've been to Korea. I haven't spent a lot of time in Korea, but you know, I spent a big portion of my life in Asia. I've set up businesses in India. Okay. And we had offices in India, like in the south, in Kerala, and up in the north in Calcutta. Mm -hmm. And at one point in Chennai as well. So I spent a lot of time in India. I, spent, um, I lived for a short time in Thailand. Okay. And then... Um, you know, I, I, for me, Asia was always the frontier. Yeah. It was always, I mean, if you're young and curious, it was always where you wanted to go. Not that, like even in the 90s, if you went to Asia, it was a bit risky. Right. You went there if you were kind of a little bit, you know. In, edgy. You're a bit edgy. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't go there like now where it kind of makes a lot of sense as a career choice, right? You went there because it was still a little bit exotic. I mean, if you came to Singapore in 1995, it would have been an emerging economy in many yeah. respects, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's like a powerhouse now. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's very very different, right? Mm. But Asia has changed so much, right? But that was what it was, and that's what it meant to me back then. So that's quite a brave move, then, isn't it? That's quite a brave move. So you, you, what was the trigger for that then? What what made you up and go to the house of you know the, not the house of rising sun? It's, that's the that's the famous animals. It's right? the animals. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a whole house somewhere in the US. I didn't go there. Uh, the land of the rising sun. It's interesting that like, Japanese don't call it that. Uh, I went in. Okay, so the, the the genesis of that is I graduated with an AI degree in 1995. Okay, AI and yeah, and I walked into the careers library with an AI degree, thinking I was kind of like it. Hmm. And, I, and, you know, the, these universities had careers libraries then and yeah, careers right. advisors. Yeah. 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 I don't know what they're called, careers development units or something now, but the careers libraries back then. And I walked in and I remember I said to the, the woman, I said, Look, I've graduated with this AI degree. You're like, I want to go and do something. What have you got? And she <laughs> had to explain to her what AI was first, which is like, you know, what the hell is AI? And then she like gave me this list and said like, okay, this is a job for you. And literally it was just a page and she ran her finger down it. And on that list, it said, teach English in Japan. So I was like, okay, all right, what do I need to do to teach English in Japan? And she just said, teaching, I'm sorry, speak English. So that was it. That was how I got to Japan. It wasn't part of the plan or the design. And or it just, just sounded... It was just a flow chart she showed you something, like a decision tree. Like if this... No, no, it, it, no, it wasn't that clever. It was just what was available. <laughs> Boing. Yeah, it was, the, it, was, it was the only job that she knew that... <laughs> oh, that's the only qualification she knew that I had was to teach, was to speak English, right? That was it. This guy can speak English. We need teachers in Japan. That will do. I thought, yeah, this sounds right. I'll do it. So that's how it all started. So there wasn't any jobs in AI back then, but that's how I got my ticket to Japan. Wow. And how long did you stay there then for? Quite a while. Uh, I stayed until like 98 and then came back to the UK, uh, set up a business in uh, telecoms in the late 90s. All right. And spent a while in the UK, about 12 years. Mm -hmm. Got out of that business. Um, it could run its course. And then um, went and traveled the world for four years with my family. And then we just went all over. We spent a lot of time in Asia. We spent time in Okinawa, which is out in the East Island, uh, East China Sea. It's this sort of tropical, subtropical island. Spent time in the Canary Islands, two years there. And then just like traveled all around the world, just going around. And then, uh, yeah, saw a lot of Asia. 
So, yeah. Interesting. That's the story so far. This is a good question then. How, how can you do an AI degree? Because obviously AI is like the, the, the latest kind of buzzword. Everybody kind of says, what is AI? Da, 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 da. What, yeah. what, what, where do you do an AI degree in 1995? Where? In the University of Sussex. And, um, well, it was called, it was called a, a degree in, in artificial intelligence. Probably. Yeah, I mean, it, what, artificial intelligence has been around since the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. right? And it, it sort of evolved in and appeared in many, many different forms um, artificial intelligence at my time was because the computational power was not there. You know, yeah. this is like pre windows 95. Like, you know, think about that. <laughs> that was like, we're still DOS or 3.1. Yeah. Yeah. And that was like state of the art back then. Artificial intelligence was a mix. It was philosophy, epistemology, which is the study of knowledge, um, computational psychology, AI, uh, evolutionary biology, neuropsychology, which is the study of the brain, mm. um, and cognitive psychology, which is the study of like, perception, senses, and memory, and so on. So it was a real mix, but it was called artificial intelligence. Okay. But it would be in cognitive sciences. That, that was the okay. Okay. Yeah, department, yeah, yeah. right? Mm. So, I mean, like, AI now is all machine learning, because that's where the results are. That's yeah. where it's happening. Yeah. But, AI still is that bigger umbrella that stretches all the way from philosophy to biology. Right. Okay. So I think, you know, if you did AI today, it would probably be very specific about machine learning. But back when I took it, it was very sort of more philosophical. About yeah, I was say, it's a bit like a classic. It sounds like a bit like a classics degree of AI. Right. Yeah. 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 It's a good way of putting it, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. You have this sort of very rounded approach to it, right? Which mm. would be, I suppose, in like the PPE type degree isn't it a bit of everything yeah 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 fantastic a bit of you had your like, time graham ahead of your time renaissance well, the, yeah there's two ahead of your time andrew it's like, <laughs> it's like when you're two ahead of the curve <laughs> nobody knows what the hell you're doing like what is ai in 1995 i did my thesis like my my thesis and i talked about it on my podcast be more human my thesis in 1995 was about robotic cockroaches <laughs> Uh, okay and it was it it was like modeling robotic cockroaches and the thing is it's like i had two mentors this this it just shows you what the world was like back then actually no the three like sort of key names hmm. in my faculty who were like defining the the, the sort of corpus of knowledge that we were, they were studying one was um a guy who was a world leading expert in frog psychology <laughs> Seriously, he. What, you called, I don't know what, what, was it, what was that? What was that? That frog game where we used to play. You know, when you jump across the road and you get squashed. Frogger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had he had advanced. So basically, he was. You know, he had basically built this model where he could predict, like, if you put a fly to the left or the right of the frog, it would like jump left or jump right. And that was his <laughs> whole life doing this thing. And he was sought out expert. If you want to know about frogs, speak to him. He was one. There was this other guy, I think, called David Cliff forgive me if I'm wrong, who was building robotic insects. And he, he was like the man. He was like building these things. Like, you know, those kind of like Boston Dynamics dogs. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was yeah. building that kind of stuff in the, the labs back then. And then, you know, not those dogs, but just kind of cockroaches. So like a robotic centipede. Yeah, yeah. And just like weird stuff, which was great. It was like a real <laughs> Aladdin's cave of magic tricks. And then the last one, it was... I won't name her because she's actually, she's just published a book now, but anybody who knows University of Sussex will know her. She was like the dean of that sort of faculty and she, I've given it away, but she <laughs> is so old school. I remember she gave a lecture and she was like, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence. Now, a lot of you use computers here. A lot of you young kids use computers. I personally hate computers and I don't know how to use them. And that was it. That was like, she taught well, for, that was what you said. yeah, she taught for wow. three years and she, she would always say, I hate computers. So I'm just going to talk about artificial intelligence. And that's the world that we came from back then, which was kind of interesting because then she just talked about, she philosophied about what it could be, right? Rather than did well, anything. That's like, I mean, that's like that's that reminds me of the quote. What was it was the guy? The guy was the ex IBM CEO when he said, "There's no future in the in the, in the personal computer." Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> and yeah, other, good luck to her. And other such great insights from IBM, Weston. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't get to choose our teachers. We just get given them. Yeah, you see, well, you, so, so it's interesting. So, so literally, um, I've just joined a, a board, an advisory board, uh, and it's about, it's called We and AI. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's basically a, um, a not-for-profit, you know, it's an NGO, basically, non-government organization, mm. um, about ethics, AI ethics. Oh, okay. And um, the, the CEO of it is uh, my very good friend, Tanya Duarte. Okay. For her. And uh, she's joined by the, one of the ex-CTOs from Microsoft. Um, mm. So, um, yeah, it's Nigel. So it's, 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 yeah, it's an interesting... There's a very interesting group of people involved in that, and they're looking at you know how the, you know, is it this kind of I suppose this thing tech for good? It's this kind of yeah, thing. yeah, interesting yeah. area. AI is here, but is it is it you know it, it, people say is AI already here, and people say yes, it's already here. It's doing this, this, and this, and they don't even realize it, AI is doing this already. Yeah, <laughs> it's this kind of thing about you know rise of the machines, Skynet, etc., etc., etc. So yeah, this That's, is the era of the machine. Exactly. In fact, we are both machines, actually. We're both robots here. This is not actually really live humans. This is robots. This is our robot. <laughs> well, actually, this is the one thing that machine can't fake, a conversation. Not yet. <laughs> uh, and not, not never. Until we program machines to make mistakes. Do we program machines to take, not take? Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, because they always want to, yeah, okay. They always, well, I mean, like, they always want to get it right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, if, if you think about, for, you know, what, what machines are efficient. I mean, that's the nature of a machine, isn't it? And it's designed not to make a mistake and not to fail. Yet every single interesting story, and if you look at whether it's a Hollywood movie or every good book or every superhero is made engaging by the fact that they'd make mistakes right that's the hero's journey yes, joseph yeah. campbell talks about the hero's journey mm -hmm. and you know you think superman had kryptonite you know and if he didn't have that then it wouldn't have been engaging and that's the point is that we can't have this conversation because it's not human because it wouldn't be replete with all the kind of foibles and mistakes and vulnerabilities that make it interesting right yeah. be otherwise it'd just be transaction perfect be too perfect you know, basically what you're saying. yeah and like you know what why would we listen into it it's like a song isn't it i mean every single song i mean ai can write music but can never sing a song because it's never experienced loss right oh, you you mean the, emotion, from, the emotion side of it yeah yeah i mean you know every good song is a sad song right it contains yeah. loss in it and it, 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 that person is singing it singing from position of pain and experience and that you know you understand me because you're speaking for me right and that that that's the very human experience which ai cannot by design replicate depends, what, therefore... depends what music you're listening to i mean you know I'm, I'm listening to van halen and acdc at the moment so you know right well there you go and the <laughs> fact is that highway, to hell, that highway to hell or back in black you know i mean there's no loss in that one it's just lots of guitars well, the fact it's about hell in itself is... That's good, awesome. isn't it? Hell's good, isn't it? I thought hell was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not highway to heaven, right? <laughs> no, it's stairway to heaven. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, even that's a song about loss, right? I've sung... I've actually sung... This is, I've, I've, to film, actually. I've actually sung Stairway to Heaven live in a bar in Ibiza many, many moons. Right. And there was, it wasn't just me in the bar. There was 300 people in the bar, and I got a standing ovation. Unfortunately, I made a mistake. The guy said, you know, because he said, any requests? You know, he's playing the guitar. And I said, stay away to heaven. He says, oh, I don't know the words to that. You have to come and sing it on stage. And I go, damn, you have to. damn. So, yeah. But well, isn't that interesting, though, that, that it just goes to show about that human experience is that the fact you did it live made it valuable, right? Mm -hmm. But why do we do live? Why, why do we have music? Why do we have live music? it shouldn't exist by logical analysis, right? We shouldn't need this. Why has music been around for thousands of years? And why do we enjoy that live experience? Mm. Because it can go wrong, right? Because when you went up on stage and sung, mm. everybody was like for a minute, just holding their breath. It's like, 
we don't know. This guy is going to just bomb <laughs> yes. or rocket. We just don't know. And it, does he know the words? Is he going to like, is he going to be like some awful pub karaoke singer or is he going to rock it? We don't know that moment. That's what gets us, that, right? I was going to put that kind of Robert Plant hair, you know, that hair piece. Yeah. And then I put the lizard, you know, the, the kind of the Jim Morrison lizards, lizard king pants on. They knew it was going to be awesome. You see. Look, wow. Luckily, it was before the iPhone, so nobody could ha hold the phone up. And exactly. So we'll take your word for it. Yeah, exactly. So no, there's no YouTube then. <laughs> Thank God. So, so, <laughs> so what, um, what are your current projects and what, what do you currently do then? It sounds like you've been traversing the, the world, which is great. Fantastic. I've been to 49 countries in my life. Uh, so I've obviously got some more to go yet. But, um, sounds like you've what, done quite well. What, what do you... Um, what do you what do you do these days? What keeps you keeps you engaged and awake? Well, I'm a podcaster, storyteller. That's my passion. I love telling stories. I love sharing stories, hearing stories. And the fact that I get paid for that is great. The company is called Pickle and Co. We're a B two B podcast agency, which is podcasts and webinars, all about live shows. And whilst we're a podcast agency. We use a lot of machine learning, um, increasingly so, to help people have better conversations. Our philosophy is automate to elevate, which is basically robots lift, humans serve, which is the design of what we, our philosophy in that we use AI and machine learning to automate and to help, you know, the human which is not the AI, have a better conversation, right? So whether that's giving them data about what they should talk about or feedback on their performance, mm -hmm. the AI can never replace that human, but it can elevate that human to do that better. And I think that's the perfect sort of coexistence of AI and humanity. That sort of, you know, where one is doing the heavy lifting and the other is focusing on, it, it's like that book, uh, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi wrote that book, Flow. Oh yeah, it's yeah. Just that, you know, like whether it's like you know the tennis player hitting the ball or the mm -hmm. you know the craftsman, the potter on yeah. the wheel, right? Yeah. It's that zone. And I think for us, the human flow is storytelling, connection, empathy, mm -hmm. authenticity, communication, mm -hmm. all of that. And the problem is, Andrew, is that everything else gets in the way. Work gets in the way of flow. So we talk about less work, more flow. You know, a classic example is a doctor who signs up to serve humanity and takes the Hippocratic Oath, right? Yep. Ends up spending all his or her time in paperwork. Right. And so becomes less human. Mm. But if you were to take away all that paperwork and the pattern recognition of scans and the stuff that doesn't need humans, the doctor could spend more time beside the bedtime talking to the patient and saying, how are you doing? Which is very human, right? And I think you can apply the same approach to podcasts as well. Mm. which is take away all that heavy lifting such that we can just focus on this moment and connecting and sharing a conversation. So what you're saying is kind of taking away the non-value add kind of thing. Yeah. Well, these are, I mean, in poker terms, these are table stakes, right? It's kind of like you've got to be able to produce a podcast and edit it. But at the end of the day, it's the connection that people want. It's the conversation, that yeah. human conversation, right? And how do you elevate that and enhance that mm. without all the work getting in the way of it? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. That sounds good. That sounds great. I mean, I, I think, I mean, you know, as you've probably seen, uh, the ex explosion, the explosion, the, the, the rise, the, you know, the, the kind of, uh, yeah, it's not it's explosion, the explosion of the podcast, the podcast familia, La Familia, yeah? La Familia. How, how, many, yeah. how many podcasts are there in the world these days? Millions. And interestingly, people will say, but everybody has a podcast now. To which my reply would be, well, have you got one of these phones? You say, yeah, but oh, everybody has a phone now. <laughs> that's the point, isn't it? It's like if you think about what a podcast is, you can think about that explosion of podcasting as an explosion in social media, or you can think about it as an explosion in communication. I think about, think about podcasts as communication and not media. And it's very, very different. 
Because when people think about podcasts as media, it's about how do I create real estate to advertise, to get eye eyeballs. Mm. I think about it as communication, which is very different, which in a sense is like in the old days, you know, um, if you wanted to contact and communicate with a company, you mm. either had to go to the company or go through some channel. And it was very inefficient, right? And the company couldn't communicate with you. You had yeah. to put an ad in the newspaper, TV, radio. Mm. And then the internet came along and created this different interface for communication, which was actually, I could go to the website without phoning up the switchboard and find out the opening hours of this store, or mm. they could tell me what was going on. And so websites became communication interfaces for business because the existing ones were inefficient. And that what that means is that in the context of podcasting, every business has a website now in the same way every leader will have a podcast mm -hmm. because podcasts are to leaders what websites are to businesses. They are communication interfaces, right? So when you talk about the explosion, I'll put it back to you. We haven't even started yet because mm. like, we're at like 1%, 2% of what it can be. We're at like 1997 of internet.com, internet you know, when it was like, beep, boop, beep, 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 and it was like Netscape Navigator and AOL CDs, right? Just getting started. Even with the 9600 modem. <laughs> oh, it's not that's, <laughs> that's where we are, right? Those days, oh, there was an explosion of websites, right? we're not even started yet. We look like the, the potential for podcast is like a hundred X in terms of numbers where we are today. So what we saw, so, so what you're saying, well, cause you've been doing it longer, longer than me. So you're kind of like a, you're a rock star. You're a rock star. You see, you're, you're like the Jim Morrison, Robert Plant of uh, podcasting already. You see, I don't know if I'd say Jim Morrison. It's not, it doesn't end well, does it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm past my sell by day. I'll be Robert the, Plant. I'll be the Jimmy I'll be, I'll take, I'll Robert Plant. Okay, so you be the Robert Plant, okay? He's still rocking. There you yeah, go. I'll take that. I'll take that. You ain't so, fooling. <laughs> why not? Why not? It's, it, you know, the point is, is that I think that, you know, we need more rock stars and less politicians, right? We need more people who can have, you know, build fan bases rather than win, you know electorates right that's the mindset now it doesn't matter you can create a podcast and have a hundred fans that's all that matters that's the mindset of the rock star right so more of that we need to train industry we need to train business leaders to think like this right all these years of hiding behind brands and hiding behind yes. marketing departments and hiding behind pr that's all changed you know and covid's really just accelerated that right that you know, now people need to have a voice now. Okay. Come out from companies. behind the curtain. Come be yeah. behind the curtain. Come on stage with us. Absolutely. Yeah, why not? Come Step down. up to it's the like mic. Leslie Crowler. It's like Leslie Crowler, come on down. Yeah. I don't know if the audience what? will understand who the hell that is, right? <laughs> a certain age, a certain background. The price is right. That's what they understand. It's Dusty Bin, three, two, one. Now you'll lose them. Exactly. Well, you know, it's good to be lost. For a bit. Please. So, um, so I suppose the question for on the on the T side, you know, because we're talking about the G and T sessions, right? We're talking about growth and technology. The the on the T side, the the um, what? How did you get involved in tech? I mean, you said it is only about you. Obviously, you did the, your AI degree. Yeah. But then you, you you run a telecoms business, which is quite technology oriented. I mean, did, did you just kind of fall into it? Did you just kind of find interesting it? And what you know what? Did your parents guide you into it or was it just kind of by mistake? My parents didn't know anything. They were clueless. They were typical kind of working class parents that didn't have any advice whatsoever about starting a business. The only people that started businesses or entrepreneurs in my network were plumbers. <laughs> and, okay. You know, that, yeah. Electricians. So, yeah. um, you know, the startup scene Crazy. certainly didn't yeah. exist. Mm -hmm. In terms of technology, um, you know, I was the kid that I remember my mom would say that if they left me in the house alone, and this would be when I was like five or six, they would hide all the screwdrivers. Oh, really? Because they, yeah. I had this habit and it drove them nuts. Well, that take, if I, taking all the plinths off and stuff. I, I would take everything apart. Disables. Because I wanted to know how it worked. I okay. would, 
in the old days of those old TVs with the big back, you know, remember oh, yeah, they had like the tube. The I would like to, and <laughs> these things, I'll take the back off and I look inside and think, that's really interesting. Oh, that big tube. Yeah. Yeah. The cathode ray tube. I would look at this thing. I was fascinated by how things worked. And I think I remember being given a present, a book at Christmas, which was like, you know, Christmas and birthday all in one. And the title of the book was how things work. <laughs> And all it was was just like how things worked. Like how does a TV work? How does a light work? And I was so fascinated by all of that. I don't know what it was. It's just that real insatiable annoyingness of a kid to find out why, 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 mom? Why does it work like that? And they didn't have the explanations because they weren't technical. Right. So I just had to find out myself. So, and it was, I, the downside was it I didn't put this stuff back together again. I was just interested in taking it apart. <laughs> There's like lots of debris around. Okay. It was. So there were lots of things which like, I remember my dad had this old radio from like post war, which he kept like in the greenhouse for his potting shed. Mm -hmm. I took it apart because I was fascinated by radios and how they worked, you know, and the communications devices. Took it apart. I, I couldn't work out how to put it back together again, but I understood like what it looked like on the inside. So I, the, for me that was technology and that like if you think about it, that AI, communication, psychology are all kind of the same thing. It's like, how does this work? And this, in the context of AI, is like us, our mm -hmm. brain. And communication is like, how do we work together? Mm -hmm. And telecoms is really that. Telecoms is, you know, how do we communicate and how to influence each other, right? Yeah. And storytelling, again, is the same, right? Mm -hmm. How do we influence and communicate? How does that thing work inside mm -hmm. of our head? So to me, technology is all of that. It's not sort of just one thing like, you know, computers and or mobile phones. It's the whole interaction of human beings that mm. I was just absolutely fascinated by. So that's, I mean, to me, it was only natural that I got involved in tech mm. because that was kind of where I would find myself. Putting but do you think, do you think it's changed, the perception of tech has changed? Because, you know, when, when I was involved in, when I started getting involved in tech, you know, probably somewhere around similar time to you, is that I, I just felt that it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't seen as a, it wasn't seen as it is today. It was seen, you know, why, why are you getting all this tech stuff? What, what's all this yeah. IT tech stuff? You know, what, what's all that about? And, that, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't, I didn't forecast this. I just started to find it, I, I find it interesting myself, like, like you said, but, and then actually it's become transformational. You know, it's become... Well, it's everything now, right? Everything's tech now. It holds a massive switch, and now it's cool to be in tech. You know, there's all these kind of yeah. startups that I speak to, and some of the startups I'm working with, they, they um, scale ups, and they, you know, they, they're like, they, don't, they want to leave university, and they want to go into tech, or they don't even go to university, they go straight into tech, and tech, and tech, and forget banking, tech, tech, yeah. tech, prop tech, well, te retail tech. That, that's about 20 years old, Data right? tech. Before that, there was there was nothing. Like you, I remember as a kid, to uh, one of the kids in my year, his mum and dad both worked for IBM, mm -hmm. right? And they were like super, like what you would call nerds. Right. And that was it. I mean, either you were like super intelligent, and therefore you were kind of like this child prodigy, and you got groomed yeah. by IBM. Yeah. Or that that was your choice, or you were an engineer. There was no tech as we knew it back then. If you program computers that was a little bit different. You may have caught that sort of home computing wave in the eighties. Mm -hmm. You may have like programmed games when that was popular with like the spectrum and those kind of home computing kits and so on, but nothing like it is today. It wasn't like, a, yeah, what you're saying is it wasn't a mass, mass consumer adoption or a mass, no. mass business adoption. It was very niche. You could say. Yeah. Was, and, and like, yeah. yes. I mean, there was no opportunity like there is today. That's, mm. that, that's all changed. I mean, mm. but that doesn't mean it's beyond us. It's for a new generation. It's available to all of us, right? Mm. Mm. Interesting. So, so it's part of your, your G, G, G star, G and T sessions, growth and technology. So, you know, what, what I talk about is this kind of thing and, and this thing about peaks and valleys. So mm. about, you know, the kind of the highs that you've had and, and, the, and the valleys, of, you know, the, the, the great the great things that you feel like you've achieved and then the things that maybe didn't go as planned. What, what, what were you, what would you share with us on that, on that kind of, what stories come to mind in that area? The peaks and the valleys. 
um, well, there certainly are peaks and valleys. That is what life is all about, right? That's how it is. It's never a straight line. By choice as well. Um, you know, like, if you think about being an entrepreneur, and I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years. You know, I haven't picked up a paycheck from somebody else for over 20 years. Right. So that's by design. That's by choice. So you're going to have a lot of peaks and valleys because basically somebody's just pulling the floor away from underneath you. Yeah. And you're now very vulnerable. So everything you experience is magnified. And at the same time as well, if you travel the world, and we did for four years where we lived out of suitcases. Right. The similar kind of thing happens, which is that you, you know, the highs are high and the lows are low, very mm. low, right? Mm. So, you know, there are times where you are very low and it may be a combination of the fact that you um, are hungry, are tired, you're, you're sort of vulnerable because you're living in a place where you don't understand everything and you feel insecure yeah. about your house and your job and everything. So all of that magnifies. That happens to people normally but the yeah. difference is, is that they've got people around them they've got a house which is where they've lived for 10 years mm. and monday morning they're going to the office yeah now you, you strip Not away happening. the routine and you just yeah. fall through the floor right mm. so i would say that um being an entrepreneur traveling the world are very similar in terms of peaks and valleys and you've got to be very clear that this is the path you want to take a lot of people want to start businesses um and don't understand that it's like the, uh, you know, it's kind of like the uh, Mike Tyson maxim, which is like everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Well, <laughs> let me put it this way is that like you can have a great business plan and a great pitch deck, but the reality is, is that being an entrepreneur is like getting punched in the face every single day, right? Mm -hmm. And now you've got to then say, I want to do that, right? Because if that scares you, forget it. Yeah. Like you, you, want, you whilst it's going well, it's going well. But as soon as you hit adversity, you're out. Mm. And that's why I think, you know, like when it comes to peaks and valleys, is that that's what you take on, mm. right? You, you accept that there is no floor and no ceiling now. Mm. And that's how you want to do it. That's by choice. So, yeah, I've had like massive peaks and massive valleys. I've had some great highs and great lows. So, you know, where do you want to start? <laughs> well, you know, you know, we've we've only just begun. You see, you've set me off with the, the music thing now. You see, I'm not sure if that's a good idea. You've, un, you've untriggered. You've unleashed. I'm unleashed me. All right, but don't expect me to sing. Yeah, I mean, there's been great times. I mean, I had but, great times in business. Being a mic on, you know, so you know. Well, yeah, it doesn't mean I can sing. I did it, you know. Anyway, yeah, no, so so yeah, I mean, no, it's I think you know, I think I think to, yeah, you she's spot on with. Um, you know the things that you, uh, you, you, the things that hit you, you, you don't expect, yeah. And it's 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 this thing about how do you how do you deal with that adversity uh, from a mental mental mindset point of view, and also how do you how do you deal with that? How do you self correct? You know how do you get back on track? Mm. Um, so you know I think you're spot on that we've we've all we've all been through it. And if you if you say that when people say oh yeah it's all peaks, there's no valleys, they go. Really? Are you are you, mm. are you are you living in are you living on Mars or something like that with Elon? I mean, it's like what's going on with that? That's impossible. <laughs> yeah, and it, that's the lesser talked about aspect of being an entrepreneur as well, right? The failure and suffering and the the negativity because it's there. And why 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 do you think that is? Why do you think people don't speak about it? Well, because the people that are speaking about it are probably afraid to talk about it may feel a failure um you know and they've let people down let themselves down mm -hmm. and that's part of it right it's that's how it's going to be and, and i suppose you, you then take the problem is andrew is that we are subjected to a very uh, you know, a very manicured narrative of what entrepreneurship is about through the media. And it's like, you know, it's Mark Zuckerberg and mm. to be billionaires. And it's, you know, like you mentioned, Elon Musk is survival uh, bias, survivor bias. So these, these are like one in a million, if not more. Yeah. We forget about the million that 
died on the way to that journey, right? Yeah. yeah. So what about them? How, what happened to them? Why is this the case? And I think you then compare yourself to these successful archetypes, these, these sort of very well known and think, why am I like that? What is wrong with me? Mm. So th- you ask me like, why don't people talk about it? It's because they look at that and then think, you know, I, I'm, this is my fault. You know, I'm either inadequate or mm. whatever it may be. And well, a lot of the time, it isn't. Is the mind talk kicks off then where they start kind of going into a downward spiral because if they don't control, yeah. mind takes over. Yeah. A lot of it's luck, honestly. Mm. You know, and it, it's not all luck, but a lot of it is luck. And so some people get unlucky breaks. But that's part of it, right? Mm. Yeah. That's good. So, so in terms of your business itself, then, I mean, you know, we talked about the, the explosion, the, 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 the uh, I don't know, how do you explain it even better? What would you call it? A phenomenon? The podcast phenomenon. What, what the, you, what, so in 2020 now, what, what do you, what, what's your prediction? Have you got a prediction about what, what it's going to be like in 2030? For podcasting? Well, yeah, I mean, and also what, what you, what, life. what are your dreams for your business? What, what you, what, what are your dreams and, and hopes for your business or your BHAGs, your big, hairy, audacious goals? Yeah. Well, every, everybody obviously understands now what podcasting is, but I think the, the, it's a much smaller group of people who understand how they should podcast and why they should use it. A lot of people are starting podcasts and comparing themselves to media plays like Tim Ferriss or, uh, you know, for example, Serial, these big sort of NPR style podcasts with millions of, of audience, right? These are B2C podcasts. The real growth area for me is B2B. Okay. That's massive. That, that's the opportunity. If you want to get on board, and I'm giving away the trade secrets here. If you want to get on board, the next big wave on podcasts is B2B because you've got two input factors. One, COVID, which has basically killed every single b2b marketing and communications channel that existed yeah yeah you know if you were b2b sales you were all about expos and events Mm. meetings Mm. that's all gone and it won't come back for at least another year Mm. right no nobody's going to be foolish enough to book a conference in december right because like how do you know what's going to happen nobody knows so it's going to be tough to pull that one off so that's all gone so that's on one side and the second side you've got ai which forget about what AI can do for podcasts. Let's talk about why AI is promoting podcasts. And this is what we haven't talked about yet, which is the demand for authentic conversation as a function of the supply of algorithms, right? right? Why are more and more people podcasting? Well, the reason is, is because more and more of the communications we're receiving on a daily basis is fake. Okay. So now people are placing a premium mm. on authentic connection okay. and communication. Yeah, yeah. Right. So the era of the machine will f- drive a need for authentic connection because everything can and will be faked except what can't be faked. And that is real conversation. Mm. So that's the two, the two macro ten- trends. Yeah. You've got yeah, okay. the pandemic, which was that sort of, black swan event mm. which changed you know like um satya nadella from uh satya nadella from microsoft was saying uh that you know two years of transformation happened in two months yeah and that sort of you know it's just that compressed concertina. yeah yeah the concertina effect of like what could have taken years and that that's what black swan events do you know it happens throughout history they create this massive change that could happen in decades right mm. And then you've got AI coming and forcing us to look for more authentic ways of communicating. So put all those together where those overlap is podcasts. So, so it sounds like, so it sounds like you, but you've, you evolved from running your own podcast to running podcasts for other people. Is that, is that basically what? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mostly I do my own podcast as well, but just, the sheer fun of it 
Exactly. Well, no, that, well, that's the reason why I do it because it's, I think it's enjoyable. It's, it's great. It's, it's the, the diversity of people you meet, you know, the, the, the different geographies, the different stories. It's fantastic. I mean, it's fantastic. It's such, a, it's such a rewarding exercise. It's a rich, rewarding piece of, you know, time in your diary. I think it's fantastic. Well, these are the conversations we don't have anymore. Long, long may it continue. Yeah. You know, what happened to these campfire conversations of yesteryear? They don't happen anymore. You know, people don't have one hour conversations anymore. And yet, yeah, you're right. That probably one of the most enjoyable things that you can ever do is to have a chat with somebody without really an agenda. Mm. And that has gone away. I mean, look, you look around us in society, right? That one of the most successful brands of the last 20 years has been Starbucks. Mm -hmm. like whether or not you drink there is immaterial to the fact it's it's a huge success and globally with the exception of a few markets right and why has starbucks been so successful when effectively it's about selling coffee which is twice as expensive and twice as slow as mcdonald's well the point is, is starbucks doesn't sell coffee starbucks sells space and it sells the space that we don't have anymore in our lives that social space it's been ripped apart and taken away from us right in the same way i feel that podcasts don't sell content they sell conversations the conversations we don't have anymore mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that's why when you know if you want to have a podcast go long don't do a five minute podcast because i can just go to the website and get the information right it's not about content it's about connections it's not about media it's about meetings right so i feel that that is where we need to take podcasts to kind of help people understand that it's not about taking an old format and just giving it a new life right like they did you know those old days we talked about websites in the early days well they were brochureware i remember because yeah. i had a web design company in 1998 that people were actually scanning webs as uh, brochures and uploading them to websites oh my god right that's how it was right those were the you first probably, website probably you fifty thousand pounds for it as well yeah probably <laughs> but that's kind of what people are doing with podcasts they're just taking content and they're putting it in digital audio format right it's like you and this people are doing it with webinars as well they're taking events and they're sticking them on uh webinar format which is <laughs> hang on a second you don't understand like if you're going to do a webinar and you're starting at nine o'clock in the morning you don't then start the webinar at 10 o'clock because you're still used to people having coffee and drifting into the conference room. That's not how it works anymore, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But people are still, you know, it, it, in business, it's called functional fixedness where you see some, what something can be based on what it was, right? Mm -hmm. And we've got this similar pro problem with podcasts as well is that we still see podcasts as content, which it plainly isn't. But so quick, quick question on that. Cause I've had, I mean, my, when the what? How long should a podcast episode be? There's no answer. It's like how long should a conversation be? How long should a meeting be? What's your answer? Yeah, because I mean, it's, it's, like, it's a bit like the, the the seem to be. It's interesting because people have said to me that it should be twenty minutes long. It's like it's like as though you're traveling to work and you listen to a podcast. So I, I then one of my episodes was like one hour forty one minutes, and it was like um, it's it's this interesting thing where it's a bit like the, you know the point you're making about it's people want to kind of sometimes consume stuff in a kind of bite sized way, mm. than actually the true conversation in a pub or the true conversation in a wine bar or you know that kind of free 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 flow conversation about topics that. Um, sometimes people can be comfortable with something sometimes people won't be comfortable with it it's just it's i find that's what i find fascinating about this it's just um these are some preset ideas where they kind of like try and fix it into a certain construct yeah well i mean if you think about it as content then yeah maybe 20 minutes or maybe you have to squeeze it in because you're trying to deliver information mm. in that time right but why deliver it in an ineffective format audio is not the most effective way of delivering content you just do a blog post mm. or you create an informational video mm. and that's the point is that the power of a podcast is not content it's about connection 
I advise a lot of B2B hosts, especially um, those that are trying to build authority within an area is that mm. don't even bother of thinking about your audience. Do it for all the meetings that you could have. Think about this. If you could have a hundred deep connections, right? You could have a hundred deep connections with people in your industry that would radically transform your business. Mm -hmm. There's no a hundred meetings with people and have com deep conversations, not coffee meetings, but mm -hmm. conversations you take away and last forever. Mm -hmm. And people don't think of it like that. They think about, Oh, I have to do this for all the people that might be listening to the podcast. I say to people, forget them. They're a bonus. You know, I can have a meeting with, for example, in my case, when I did Asia tech podcast, mm -hmm. my first, the first two investors, in our business were guests on the podcast. So put a value on that, right? Pretty much every client that I got in the first year of the business came from the podcast, right? They were right. Um, <laughs> referrals, guests, you know, that it's kind of put a value on that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I mean, as a business development tool, it's second to none. And then lastly, you know, I sat with Tony Fernandez as an example. I saw that. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. So, you know, what was the value we did business with air asia after that what was the value of that meeting mm. there is no way i could have sat with him for an hour mm. and talked unless i was doing a podcast so the problem is is a lot of people i mean in our space in b2b they're thinking about it in terms of media which is like how many earballs eyeballs can i get forget about that think about the value of that meeting and then all the audiences are secondary bonus. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, I mean, I, I, I started this podcast because I wanted to try and, you know, I just want to learn something new to be honest with you. And then you get into it and it becomes, it becomes, I won't say addictive, but it becomes, it becomes like a, you get into a pattern of, of just wanting to, to speak to more people. It's just, mm. it's, it's like, um, and I'm actually going to launch a few other podcasts actually very soon. So I'm going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be like a stable of stallions of podcasts. It's going to be yeah, podcast good for you. Yeah. Obviously in different niches, but um, yeah, one, one was going to be with my boxing trainer, Dino, crazy Dino from Italy. And then another one's going to be in a, another niche. So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting when you get, you get together a, a, a rhythm and a, and a pattern. It's, um, it's very, very worthwhile and very rewarding. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of your, um, I suppose my, my, one of my final questions I was going to ask about was, was about advice to people that are, you know, looking about how they build up, you know, on the business side, on the personal side, what the kind of guidance or advice would you give to people? You know, what, what are the kind of, you know, how you do distill it down to some, some takeaways for people who are looking at this area, looking at their growing their business, looking at growing their personal story. What, what's, what, what are the kind of the, the pearls of wisdom from Singapore, from Mr. Graham Brown? It's a very broad question. Where do you want to start? Like, I mean, what with business or wherever I want? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I can't give advice because I don't know who I'm giving it to. But let's say, for example, it was about business, starting your own business. We've already discussed about managing expectations and understanding that this is going to be brutal. And actually, the reason why most people fail, and obviously I'm happy to discuss to the contrary, but for my observations, and that's all I'm talking about, the reason why most people fail in business is because they not necessarily don't have the graft, um, they don't have the lack of resources or ideas, because people figure all that stuff out. I think a lot of people fail in business because they can't leave people behind i.e that to be successful in business you have to let go of a lot and that could be for example the people that are around you the people you grew up with the people that you used to work with and so on mm. and we are social animals and therefore we always crave to fit in and being an entrepreneur right. by definition means you fit out you're an anti-pattern yeah. So like, that's the challenging part. And in, in sadly, in some ways that could be somebody's partner, 
that could be somebody's family mm. and it could be the people that are around you because you can't change geographically where you are mm. and that's the hard part and understanding i think people think people fail because they run out of money or they run out of ideas it's very rarely that it's often when they you know they run out of belief in what they're doing right as, as and often that comes down to the voices uh, when are you going to stop messing around and get a proper job all those kind of things so i think that's the hard part regarding business itself and i think you know one of the things i've learned about business is that actually the hardest part if you're good at it the hardest what you're necessarily bad at is enjoying it because this is sort of the blessing and the curse of the entrepreneur and i don't speak for all entrepreneurs just ones like me is that you have the hustle because there's that constant restlessness mm -hmm. to change things to improve things to better things which gives you the energy to kind of break through the resistance of not doing it right but the flip side of that is that it's hard then to actually enjoy it because once you've achieved something you're always thinking about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing right which is hard you know and it's like you have to celebrate and i obviously when time becomes more of a precious commodity in your life mm. is that you you have to celebrate small wins like yeah. today we got this deal today i did this today i just finished six feet above ground or whatever above ground you know what i mean it's like those kind of small wins it's just that has to be celebrated because otherwise it's it's gone like that 20 years flies by right like that would be what you're talking about there is gratitude and journaling potentially helps you with that as well so. yeah gratitude's good i mean i do that to some extent and journaling i mean obviously the podcast for me is journaling mm. i think having you're, you're right having some sort of self-reflection is mm. really important i don't meditate um but you know i would advise whatever it is that works for you to kind of cultivate mindfulness because often the biggest problem to be successful in business you have to have patience mm. and it's hard because you're constantly trying to drive something and it's not yeah. moving at your speed because you're yeah. the fastest moving part of the chain because you're the entrepreneur mm. so that can be very frustrating and you've got to have a lot of patience otherwise your mental health mm. is going to suffer right yeah so i think it's just kind of i mean that's why i think at the end of the day i mean if you said like what would the advice be is surround yourself with good people mm. And podcast is a great way of doing that, by the way. Surround yourself with good people. Jim Rohn, the author, says, you know, you're the sum of or the average of the five people you hang around with on a daily basis. Yeah. And make sure that those five people are kind of filling you with positivity. I'm not saying they're sort of like Pollyanna style. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. What I mean is that they, you know, they're, they're kind of keeping you going. They're not sort of, you know, if you're having a, a crap day, Andrew, and you're kind of getting beaten up by the the nature of being an entrepreneur they're not sort of like oh you don't want to do that they kind of like come on we can do this or yeah they're listening right an authentic supportive mirror yeah so that, that i think you know surrounding yourself with good people is probably at the end of the day the measure of success in two ways firstly by doing it i think that's a good mark of success and also it's a good way of actually seeing if somebody will be successful who mm. do they hang around with mm. Mm. And so if you want to be in this game long term, find good people. It's like any adventure. It's like, you know, any adventure you've got to surround yourself with or find your band of your fellowship of. Find your tribe. Yeah. You, yeah. Your merry fools who are on this. Journey, <laughs> right? Merry fools. Robin Hood and the Merry Men. <laughs> That's right. That's what it's about. Find that band of adventurers. Is gonna, it really is a journey. Find the people who are going to go on this with you. Hmm. And that's what makes it worthwhile. Yeah, because you bounce off those people, don't you? Yeah. You kind of, I mean, I, I, um, one, of my, one of my other guests who's a very good friend of mine, he's, he's Argentinian, and um, he, um, he's worked for some extremely, extremely interesting companies and um, worked for one of the big tech titans for a number of years. And uh, literally in 18 months, we're, we're going to be going around South America together. Um, and he's, he's literally... You know, he's got all these great things he's done. He's done like five Ironmans. He's, he's been a shark. He's, 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 he's actually dives live with sharks with no cage. Mm. You know, he's, he goes, you know, we're going we're gonna to do it together. And I go, okay, fine, that's fine, that's good. So, you know, it's just, 
you know, the, the, the kind of some of the kind of people that you can hang around with. It just it gives you energy. Yeah, it's, 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 it's absolutely. It's That's what it's about at the end of the day. That is the reward rather than the means to achieve the reward, right? Mm, yeah. I think there's a great Seth Godin quote to the effect of something like, you know, the reward isn't the end goal. The goal is to keep playing the game. That's, mm. you know, the, if you're successful, you, I, I think this is sort of the mindset of entrepreneurialism, which has to be addressed because, you know, if you want to be in it long term, it's not about the achievement, it's about the achieving. I know that's sort of a well hackneyed phrase, but the point being is that if you only measure yourself as an entrepreneur by what you've achieved, it gets hard. However, if you realize that actually the reward for your efforts isn't that sort of exiting the business or raising a round or whatever it may be, your reward is your ability to keep playing the game. Mm. And I think when, when I sort of learned that for the first time, it really did change a lot of how I looked at things is this is it. This is, you know, it's sort of like Chuck Palahniuk from Fight Club. So this is your life and it's ending one minute at a time. This is it really. You know, if, if we can have this conversation, that's it. That's why we're doing it. Not we're doing this conversation to achieve this goal. Mm. The goal is to have this conversation. Yes, yes. Exactly. You know, that's really important to get right. And, you know, they talk about, I mean, I grew up, in the in an era where people were going to the moon and the space shuttle and all that and that was a very inspirational era and they would say like why what's the economic benefit of the space shuttle and they always had it in those books that well from the space shuttle we discovered teflon and teflon <laughs> non-stick frying pans right yeah. and yeah. that was it like you know billions and billions of dollars for non-stick frying pans but that's the problem. They got it wrong. Well, they're trying to justify. They're trying to justify or, or or self reverse engineer the justification for doing it. Exactly. You know, the <laughs> justification wasn't that we go to the moon or build these kind of crazy adventures to have some kind of economic benefit and a successful economy. It's the other way around. We build an excess, a successful economy such that we can do these crazy things, right, and go to the moon, mm. and think about your or so your listeners like think about your journey in that context is that once you start looking at it that way around it becomes a lot more liberating that this is the game that we get to play and therefore this is the reward it's not like i have to do this to get to something and it's a lot less stressful which is this, which explains i mean thank you for sharing that. i think it's, i think it's a very 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 spot on bullseye and actually right on the money because i think it's it's the thing about People, you know, they 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 get they say when when they want to achieve a certain um, destination, and then you you see these things where they get there, and then they well, a bit like you know, boxing example, Tyson Fury, yeah, yeah, Mike Tyson, these kind of things where they get to a certain level of achievement, their 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 life goal, and then they they lose they lose their yeah, their well, that, kind of, that's it, their right? Drive their will. And actually, then they have to re, 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 recalibrate, regroup, and then start again, or you know, go back again. Um, so it's it's a bit like, um, I mean, you know, Brian Rose uh, from London Real says it's about the journey, which is mm. which is not which is not far wrong actually. To be honest with you, what, what you just said. Absolutely, yeah, so. I, I believe it. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Graham Brown, for joining us today from Mr. Andrew Turner, from glorious Singapore. Yeah, and it is uh, glorious at the moment. It's 32 degrees. I know it's not as hot as UK, but let's have this conversation in two months' time and see who's winning because my friends in the UK, it's 37 degrees. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you see everybody in the UK jump, jumps, out, jumps out and uh, just like, you know, gets, gets un, un, unclothed and jumps out, puts Pink. a on people and gets burnt like a lobster. Yeah, so. yeah exactly. Let them enjoy it. I don't want to knock event, them. They, they, so my final yeah. question for you, actually, well, we're, well before we finish, is um, so gin and tonic, G and T, yeah. Mm. So I know there's obviously a very famous bar in called Raffles in Singapore, which I have been in once. And there's also some very good gin bars in, in, in Singapore. 
So what, what would you say is your favorite gin? Do you have a favorite gin? <laughs> favorite gin. I don't really, I'm not a connoisseur of gin, but I like the idea of gin. I was always sort of fascinated by those kind of Hogarth paintings of London, and gin joints, where they all kind of had that sort of warped sort of body <laughs> that he drew and there'd be like prostitutes and lords smoking a pipe of whatever in the back street. Yeah. So I kind of like that sort of very down at heel and seedy version of gin. Uh, gin's changed a lot now. It's very upmarket. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I think I, I think we need to take it back to its roots as this, you know, the gin lushes and all that <laughs> kind of thing. I think that there is a space and now it's all sort of like premium gin, isn't it? Like Tangeray and all that stuff. Now it's got to be, let's take it well, back to where it came from. Gin is fruit gin. There's, there's all different yeah. types. So yeah, anyone, take it Anyone particularly you spring to mind, or are you are you are you going to abstain? Or I'm not. I'm not. A, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you if it's a good gin or a bad gin. It's oh, really? not something. No, no, I wouldn't be able to tell. I remember my dad used to make slow gin, so that was made out of berries of some slow yeah, berries, yeah. whatever they are. Yeah. yeah. That was. Uh, I know that that was not a good gin because it was homemade, right? So I'm sure it probably would have made you blind if you drunk enough of it. So I'm not a connoisseur. <laughs> I think that put me off gin for life. But I do. I don't mind. I will drink maybe it. Maybe you should do. Maybe that, that's what. Maybe what I should do in the future. I should bring out my own gin brand, Gin Tea. <laughs> yeah. I can give it yeah, as a, yeah. bottle, a bottle to each guest that comes on the show. Why not? You can so do that. You, you can even just badge it. Exactly. The, the GNT sessions. Yes. Yeah, straight here. You can get, Tesco's gin. Get, get drunk before you come on the GNT session, <laughs> and, and during it and after. So right, let's do it live wants, then. So every, yeah, exactly. We'll have to have a live gin tasting. So if anybody wants to get hold of you um, to, to talk about what you do as a business um, and, and get some guidance and advice on, on stuff you work on, which sounds really interesting. I know, you, I know you're working with, with some fantastic brands in, in Asia and globally. Um, how, how, what's the best way of uh, finding out more about what you do and finding out more about your, your podcast empire? Thank you. Uh, easiest way, my website grahamdbrown.com that's graham with an h that's grahamdbrown.com you can find out that's more about what i talk about my public speaking podcasts and so on and that's one way company websites pickle p-i-k-k-a-l.com which is the agency itself and then just find me on linkedin search me then it's not pickle like in pickle pickle no p-i-k-k-a-l okay yeah so the one so what was your final thing you said LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where I haunt and frequent most of the time. So you'll find me there. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank, thank you. you so much for the, for the episode. Thank you so much for the time for today. And uh, great to see you from Singapore. Sandra Turner, founder and host of the GNT Sessions podcast with Mr. Graham Brown from Pickle and keynote speaker and future author, potentially, I'm sure. And um, see you soon. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks very much.